Yes, uh, uh, my name is uh, Peter Sloan. I work at the University of Buckingham in the UK. Um, it's the smallest university in the UK. Uh, it has about 2,000 students and it's the only, pri well, it's one of two private institutions in, in, in the United Kingdom. So a very small place to work, but a very international place. We have a sort of very global cohort of students. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so several. So my first book was on David Foster Wallace. My second book was on Kazura Ishiguro. My current book is a study of 21st century refugee life writing and fiction, uh, which is due to be published with Liverpool University Press, hopefully by the end of this year. Uh, I'm also working on an edited collection of global refugee cultures as well. So this brings together 18 scholars that are working in different areas of the arts and humanities to think about how refugees are reflecting on and expressing their experiences in 21st century culture. Um, I'm also working on a new article on Kazuo Ishiguro, um, which is, I would say, a very important radical rereading of one of his most uh, important um, novels. Um, and actually, being here for the last month has enabled me to pretty much finish that article, because otherwise, with my normal commitments, it was very difficult to find time to do that. But my next project, uh, in terms of my next book project, is looking at um, post-Holocaust genocides in 21st century fiction and 21st century memoir. So I want to think about this idea that after the Holocaust there was this suggestion of never again, um, and I want to think about the ways in which genocides in Darfur, in Rwanda, in Indonesia, for example, have been captured in contemporary, contemporary writing. So, yeah, I mean, the invitation came from Paul Veyre, um because uh, Paul has been a long time advocate for the work of Kazura Ishiguro. Uh, Paul started working on Ishiguro around 30 years ago. Um, and, s I mean, I, I started reading Ishiguro scholarship and I came across Paul's work on Ishiguro. So we've, we've done some kind of collaborative projects around Ishiguro. Um, so that's been, I mean, really, though, the focus of this, the focus of this experience was supposed to be around refugee writing. Um, so as while I've also been working on the Ishiguro article, I've also been thinking about um, my own chapter for the edited collection, um, which is going to be on what I call the anatomical poetics of contemporary refugee writing. So I want to think about the ways in which refugee fictions uh, foreground the idea of corporeality, the relationship between the body and displacement, uh, but also the way in which they use the body as a kind of symbolic or metaphorical artifact to, to try to convey the experience of displacement. Um, and the kind of central premise really is that um, when we think about displacement, we often think about the kind of cognitive, psychological or emotional traumas that are attendant on displacement or refugeehood. Um, but actually what displacement means and what being a refugee means is moving your body from one place to another. The assumption that the place that your body currently is is hostile to your life and the imagination that the place that you intend to go to will be hospitable to your life. Of course that generally isn't the case um, because of xenophobia and current anti-refugee and anti-migration um, discourse. Um, so I've been working on those two things really. Uh, it's been a very diverse day actually. So for example just this morning um, I had uh, a two-hour session. So I also work on film um, and recently last year I published a book on Claire Denis, the great French filmmaker. Um, again that was an edited volume where I brought together lots of scholars and I contributed a chapter in the introduction to that. Um, so that was working with research master's students who are working in film. Um, so here we were really thinking about the the idiosyncratic nature of film as a visual medium and how that sometimes is untranslatable either into text or from text as well. So the relationship between textuality uh, and visual, visual cinematic language. Um, but also the first paper I gave um, was on the way in which refugees think about their experience of lost homelands as well. So that was for, um, again, I think that was for a kind of doctoral, doctoral school of students. But then I had a really interesting session with um, two groups of Paul's undergraduate students talking about Never Let Me Go and sort of proposing this new reading to them. Um, so again, it's been kind of a mixed experience working across all of the different levels of the institution from first year undergraduate to PhD level, um, but also working across and thinking about the relationship between text and film. I'd say, well, <laughs> 
the advantage and the benefit is I, I don't have to worry about the bureaucracy of the institution where I do at my home institution. Um, I'm not aware of the management structures and I don't need to be aware of the management structures. I don't have any administrative responsibilities. Uh, I don't have your students emailing me asking me to do things for them that they should be doing themselves. So that's one of the benefits. Um, but really it's to get a kind of more international perspective on my own work but also to try to understand how other people think about the work that I'm doing um, and I think that sort of broad cultural exposure is something that is under threat in the UK at the moment particularly post Brexit where there's been a kind of growing insularity um, nationally but also that's now becoming manifest in our higher education institutions as well um, you might not be aware but the vast majority of modern foreign language programs in the United Kingdom are currently under threat and being closed and this is a terrible loss for us and a kind of evidence of the xenophobia of our current government and regime so um, you know I went to dinner recently with uh, one of your uh, VPs and you know uh, originally he's from Greek he did his undergraduate degree in German he did a PhD in French he speaks multiple languages and you know, I, I think the real benefit for me is to be immersed in an international community that values cultural exchange. And that's, you know, and I would also say the same thing of your students. I, I speak a little bit of French because my wife is French, um, but actually the vast majority of your students are not only capable of, but happy and prepared to converse in complex and sophisticated ways in English. And that kind of, well, firstly, the ability to do that, but also that gesture. Uh, is incredibly welcoming. Uh, yes and no. So I, I think as a, as a kind of visiting professor, visiting scholar, yes, where, where the remit of my stay has been predominantly research and disseminating my research. But um, a few years ago, I went to the University of Mainz, well, uh, Johannes Gutenberg uh, University in Mainz as an Erasmus exchange for two weeks. Um, and I was there teaching experimental writing. So I was thinking really about postmodernist fiction and various forms of innovative explorations of fiction as a form. Um, and again, it was a comparable experience. You know, I went there as, I would say a typically linguistically ignorant British person with an expectation that people would be speaking my language and you know fortunately they did but there's always a kind of embarrassment for me in, in doing that but yes so no this is my second time of working at a, another European institution and my second time of realizing the value and importance of those kinds of cultural exchanges and again just just to add um, you know the UK has now lost Erasmus. We don't have Erasmus anymore, this magnificent institution which provides exchange, cultural exchange across all of these in institutions across Europe is something that we no longer have. So, um, so again, it's very, very important for me to participate in these whenever I get the opportunity. Well, hopefully, well, so Paul Veyre owes me a book chapter. Uh, so I'll be nagging him constantly uh, until he till he provides that. Um, but I, I think that's a very good question. Um, I think it's a very important question. Um, how do you ensure that the connections that you make and the networks that you build during these exchanges flourish into longer term collaborative relationships. Um, I mean, in terms of research, that's relatively straightforward because I am working with Paul and will continue to work with Paul on various issues around refugee related stuff. Um, but I think I need I need to think about how this can be a kind of catalyst to encourage more international collaborations for my home institution um, because I think that's the most valuable part of this experience for me. So in terms of research it's going to be relatively straightforward but I think I need to take some time to to make sure that this isn't a small thing that I've done that doesn't amount to anything else in terms of network building. It is and you know I will just say that every single person I know that works in UK HE um, recognises that it is absolutely disastrous that we've lost that fundamental cultural exchange programme. And, no, you know, I don't know one single academic that voted, for example, for Brexit, that voted to sever this vital connection that had been fostered over an extensive period of time for the sake of some kind of ludicrous political or financial gain, which in fact never materialised. I mean, financially now we're in a worse state than we were before Brexit and that will continue yes. to be the case. So, no, that's true. I mean, uh, one of your, I, the VP that I had lunch with has suggested that um, he is currently in the process uh, of putting in a bid for some money to look at migration in and around Europe and 
of course that's my area of concern so that might also be a possibility for future collaborations as well and hopefully the, the opportunity for me to come back again and spend some more time here um, it's, a, it's a great institution I've really enjoyed it